Good morning, and welcome here. So, I have heard a few times that uh, Matt has moved on to his new occupation in Landmark. Pray for him. No, I'm kidding. Um, and uh, Peter Hebert doesn't sing hymns every, every Sunday any, or once a month anymore. So I've been encouraged to sing some hymns. Today, we are going to sing four hymns. If you want to kick it old school and grab your red hymn book, you can do that. I'm going to do it. They will also be up on the, on the board. So, And our first one is Brethren, We Have Met to Worship, page 15. If you'd like to stand, Kurt, I invite you to do that. Sorry, cut Jody off there. and adore the Lord our God. Will you pray with all your power while we try to preach the word? All is vain unless the Spirit of the Holy One comes down. Brethren, pray shower all around. Sisters, will you join and help us? Moses' sister aided him. Will you help the trembling mourners who are struggling hard with sin? About the Savior, tell them Sisters, pray and holy man, I will be showered all around. Let us love our God supremely, let us love each other too. Let us love and pray for sinners till our God makes all things new. home to heaven at his table we'll sit down christ will gird himself and serve us with sweet manna all around Ooh. i forgot that when you speed up a hymn you can't breathe all right for scripture today i'm going to be reading from second corinthians 1 uh, 1 verse 20. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He has anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. So, with that promise in mind, we are going to sing Standing on the Promises, page 175. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior, standing. Standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises that cannot fail. 
When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God I shall prevail, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises of Christ the Lord, bound to Him eternally by love's strong cord. Overcoming daily by the Spirit's sword, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises, I cannot fall. Listing every moment to the Spirit's call. Resting in my Savior is my all in all. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing. Standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Now we're going to flip back to page 32. All praise to Him who reigns above in majesty supreme, who gave His Son for man to die, that He might man redeem. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. His name above all names shall stand, exalted more and more. At God the Father's own right hand, where angels hosts adore. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Redeemer, Savior, friend of man, once ruined by the fall, thou hast devised salvation's plan. For thou hast died for all. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. His name shall be the counselor. The mighty Prince of Peace Of all earth's kingdoms conquered Whose reign shall never cease Blessed be the name, blessed be the name Blessed be the name of the Lord Blessed be the name, blessed be the name Blessed be the name of the Lord. And just a few pages back on page 17, Come Thou Found. Sing thy praise, 
streams of mercy never ceasing calls for songs of loudest praise teach me some mellow dissonant sung by flaming tongues of love praise the mount i'm fixed upon it mount of safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. Thank you. You can have a seat. And one other special announcement. Mrs. Janet Boat has a birthday today. You can, you can thank someone for that. Good morning, everyone. Um, as you know, we had VBS, and it was a fun time. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, a lot of work, but a lot of blessings and a lot of joy that came through it as well. Um, we had five days total with uh, 65 kids registered for the week. Um, we had a Bible point we focused on every week, and we started each evening with getting to know Mickey Way. For those of you that were there, this was Brad, dressed up as an astronaut, and um, yeah, he did great. <laughs> we learned about all the different problems he was facing on the moon, and uh, then we also learned some songs and actions with Carrie as she was leading singing. Um, the kids had so much fun singing. We took turns letting them come up on stage and lead with Carrie. So uh, each day the kids went to five different stations. We went to KidVid, where they heard about real kids and their lives and how the Bible points can be used in your life. Um, I don't want to forget the wonderful snacks that were made for the kids during KidVid when they got to watch the movie, so it was like kind of sitting in a theater for them. Um, they also got a chance to run off their energy and compete against their leaders in different games. Um, they had a lot of fun there with Kevin. Uh, the Imagination Station, Arlen did an amazing job teaching the kids some science fun and also how that implies to God and his creation in the world. They had interactive Bible adventures with Candace all week. Um, we blacked out the sanctuary and it was pretty dark and they got to tell stories by lantern or flashlight and really try to make it hit home with uh, what it all means to be the light of Jesus in this world. Um, yeah, they learned a lot of cool stuff this week, uh, that week, and I also learned a lot, and I got to really enjoy the kids. Um, for me, the biggest thing is that joy that I get to see on their faces. It's a lot of work to put together for everybody, but watching the kids and watching them shout out the Bible points and things like that all week, it's just worth it. Um, I have a few pictures for you. Um, we run around all week, so we don't get a chance to take a lot of pictures, but I have a few pictures if Darren wants to get those up for you. 
Um, this is Kid Vid with Jody, which I didn't mention. She's kind of hidden out in the, in the boardroom there, and we make it look like it's space, and the kid's sitting there listening to the stories and having fun working through their workbook. The next picture. This is our blacked out Bible adventure. Um, Candace was sharing with them and talking to them about the birth of Christ this day, so it was pretty dark, and yeah. <laughs> so it's hard to take pictures when every day the Bible adventure is blacked out, but this is Candace and the kids. Uh, the next one. This is at our imagination station with Arlen and the kids. Um, every day there was a different experiment. Every day there was something for, fun for them to learn. And um, we found out that there are a few kids that know a lot about space. So we got to learn a few things too, which was fun. <clears throat> our next one, this is games. Um, this was a rain day. So the games were ended up in the, oh, well, rain or just way too hot outside. We ended up in the gym. But yeah, they got a lot of fun to compete against their leaders and just run off some energy. We usually had a selection of like three games to play every day, but they only played usually one because that was fun for them. They enjoyed it and they had so much fun playing that one game. Why change it? Um, this is Mickey Way. This is Brad and myself on stage doing our skit every beginning of every evening. Um, Brad is a very comical and fun for the kids and they like to bug him all week that uh, while he's at me media that he's still Mickey Way and he tries to say that he's his twin brother so yeah we work with that <laughs> um, this is Carrie and Aaliyah and Liam that are up on stage they start off the week um, and then as a, the week progresses more kids join them up there and yeah they do a lot of work learning the actions and the songs and just focusing on how to teach the kids that, but just to make it fun. It's very loud in here uh, for VBS, and that's, yeah, you can't hear anything or talk to anybody during the music, but I guess that's the point. It's just a lot of fun. Um, yeah. So I have a few th things that the kids learned this week. Um, on day one, we always focused on a Bible point. Um, I was kind of hoping there would be more kids here so they could sh shout back at me, but that's okay. Aaliyah, when I was reading this at home, Aaliyah was shouting back at me the Bible point. So on day one, our Bible point was, when life feels dark, you shine Jesus' light. <laughs> um, they heard a story about the birth of Christ and how he's the light of the world. Uh, John 8, verse 12 was talking about, I am the light of the world. Um, they learned about why stars look like they're twinkling in the imagination station, which I thought was really neat. Um, on day two... Uh, they learned when people don't get along, you, sh you shine Jesus' light, yep. They heard the story of Zacchaeus and how Jesus' light changed his heart and how we are to live in harmony with all people in Romans 12, 16. They learned how they did an experiment with soap and milk and uh, food, food coloring and how the soap break down, breaks down the milk fat. And it talks, it's just kind of how things move around in space and they got a good conversation going on that. On day three, when things happen, you shine Jesus' light. They had a praise parade to celebrate Jesus as king. They shouted with joy to the Lord, Psalms 100, verse 1. And then we attempted to make baking soda rockets, but they didn't go so well. <laughs> the first one worked, and after that, not so much. But we got a few to fly a little bit. On day four, when people are sad. Daddy. Thanks, Addy. <laughs> They, had, um, they learned how the death and res resurrection of Jesus changed us forever, how we shouldn't let our hearts be troubled, John 14, verse 1. And in the Imagination Station, they were able to talk about the black holes in space and what that all entails. Um, day 5, we learned when people need help, you shine Jesus' light. They helped each other read a very confusing message, with, uh, just like Philip helped the Ethiopian understand what he was reading. Um, we are to let our good deeds shine so that everyone will praise God, Matthew 5, 16. Um, that experiment they did that day was about kind of what it feels to be in zero gravity. I believe that was the egg one, um, where you put an egg on top of a jar and then it gets sucked into the jar. Um, the kids thought it was pretty cool. Some of them had seen it before, but those that hadn't, it was really neat. The kids love the excitement of the music, the games, the snacks, the interactive Bible studies, and meeting Mickey Way, of course. Every year we have a different person, and Brad has been 
so kind as to play those parts every year so far for us. Um, he, he, this year he was an astronaut that was trying to become a captain of his own ship. Um, VBS is a blessing, and without the church's support and without the uh, support of all the volunteers, it wouldn't happen. Um, and my prayer is that the kids and leaders who attended Stellar VBS this year, that they would remember to shine Jesus' light in every way. Um, I'd like to thank everybody personally that made this week possible. Um, it takes many hands working together to make VBS work, and I'm so thankful for all of you that did that. Um, thank you very much. And I'm a planet. You might know my friends. Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And of course, your very own planet, Earth. You might think I just have eight friends. 
because you probably learned about eight planets, but your parents learned about nine. Well, not so long ago, scientists decided that Pluto was actually a dwarf planet. Aww. Poor Pluto. Even without Pluto, scientists think there might be a ninth planet out there, even farther away from the sun. And that's just in your solar system. There are tons of other stars out there with stuff orbiting around them, including more planets like me. But I'll stick with the planets you've heard of. Let me tell you about my friend, Mercury. She's super close to the sun, so you might think it's really hot on Mercury. You'd be right. But even so, scientists have found ice in some deep, shadowy craters. Or there's Jupiter. He's a big guy and a great catcher. No, not baseballs. Comets. He's a big guy for comets to try to get around. And I gotta tell you about Saturn. Long ago, when people started using telescopes, they noticed something unusual about Saturn. What was it that was all around him? Turns out, it was his rings. Boy, does he have rings. Aren't rings the coolest? But Saturn's not the only one of my friends with rings. He's just surrounded by the most impressive ones, and the only ones you can easily see from Earth. Guess what? All four of the outer planets have rings. That means Jupiter, Uranus, and Neptune all have rings too. When you look at awesome rings like mine, they might look like one solid piece. But don't be fooled, they're not. They're made up of billions of chunks of ice, dust, and rock. And all those pieces orbit a planet together as if they're one piece. So don't think of me as having a few rings. Think of me as having billions of followers. If I told you the planet Earth might have rings, you'd correct me, right? The Earth doesn't have rings. But scientists think one day it could. Its rings wouldn't be made of ice and rock like Saturn's. The Earth's rings would be made of space junk. All the parts of satellites and other man-made stuff that's broken apart in space and started to orbit the Earth. It's actually kind of a problem. It's cool how rings look like one solid piece, but are actually a bunch of pieces working together. And hey, that's a lot like how the Bible tells you humans to live. In the Bible, the book of Romans chapter 12 verse 16 says, live in harmony with each other. That means you can get along and work together, just like the billions of pieces of rock and ice that make up my stellar rings. So, the next time you want to argue with a friend, or you see someone being bullied, or you just want to get your way, remember, when people don't get along, shine Jesus' light. Good morning. Uh, so, um, we, as mission community, we tried to get our missionaries uh, that are in, within our conference to share with us. Uh, sometimes it's more challenging when they have a very short amount of time when they are at home and not uh, sharing at their own church or their sending church. Um, but uh, Ron gave us the idea of asking Kevin to do a pre recorded video um, from Panama. Uh, so, Kevin and Maria serve with Avant Ministries and are currently living in Panama, and Kevin will go into more details and he shared a few months back. Um, I will share some prayer requests that they have. Um, I'll just read it as Kevin has written it. Uh, we have been asked to participate in a missions conference in La Crete, Alberta in October. Uh, in October, pardon me. Uh, we'll arrive in Manitoba October 13 and spend a week be there before flying to Vancouver to visit supporters and then fly to Edmonton the 24th. From there, we will have to rent a car to make the seven and a half hour drive up to La Crete. 
It's a lot of travel, and we hope that snow isn't flying when we drive. Uh, wisdom, uh, another request is uh, wisdom to care for our missionaries well. They have physically, physical, mental, and emotional and spiritual needs. Uh, pray for Kevin and Maria, too, as they guide them, um, they guide their missionaries that they care for. Uh, you can pray for our own health, too, because our role of our role, it's vital that we will be healthy, too, in every way. Uh, and it's only happened one time, one time before in the past 15 years, but we find ourselves having a negative balance with Yvonne. Uh, so we ask for a prayer for additional supporters uh, so that our shortfall could be cleaned up. And uh, he says, thank you for the privilege uh, to share and for asking for a prayer request. And with that, the video can be played. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning uh, and greetings from Panama. This is being recorded not from my home, obviously, as you can tell, but from LifeBridge, our church here in Panama. And, and although I'd prefer to, to be with you physically, it's a privilege to be able to speak to you this morning this way. So as I thought and I prayed about what I should say to you, I felt like the Lord wanted me to talk about bearing God's image and bearing God's name and what that means for us. You see, being on God's mission is embedded in our identity. And if we don't understand or know who we are, we will likely not fulfill our God-given purpose. For those of you who may not know, uh, Maria and I are member care providers with Avant uh, for our Avant uh, missionaries serving in South America. Part of our role includes visiting missionaries to see them where they serve. And this past February... We did just that uh, during a visit to northeastern Brazil. In a span of 10 days, we spent time with our missionaries in four different locations. In Mucambo, two of our missionary families have opened a coffee shop in the hopes of using it as a place of outreach where they can have spiritual conversations with customers. Surprisingly, a lot of youth come to, to hang out here. And uh, so our missionaries started having a Bible study in, in small groups, which grew then to having actual services on Wednesday nights. When we were there, we met a number of the youth, and one of them is named Peter. Peter speaks English well, which is really great because between Maria and me, uh, I think we know about four Portuguese words. So uh, Peter, you know, when, when I met him, I asked him who he was, and uh, he immediately told me that he was 21 years old. He's going to university an hour away. He told me his field of study, which by now I have forgotten, and the courses that uh, he was taking, and, and he was getting a little carried away. So I stopped him, and I said, Peter, um, before, you, bef you know, I... I don't want you to get carried away. I, uh, my question to you, who are you, not what you do or, or what you've done? And so at that moment, I pulled up my phone, and uh, I, I said, you know, we all know this is a phone, but per perhaps for a moment, this phone believes that it doesn't want to be a phone anymore. It wants to be a hammer. And it, it you know, we both know that if my phone were to behave like a hammer, it uh, wouldn't take for very long before this thing would become useless. It would no longer serve the purpose it was originally designed for, nor would it be able to focus or behave like a hammer. So uh, I could tell the wheels were turning in Peter, Peter's head. And, and so before we went to interact to other youth that were there, I looked into his eyes and I told Peter that if we don't know who we are, we won't know how to fulfill our purpose. We had a great rest of the evening, and we got to meet some pretty cool kids, and everyone stayed until it was time to close up shop. And uh, so before we left, I told Peter that I would be praying for him, that he would come to know who he was. Without, having, without being clear of his identity, Peter kind of reminds me of Israel. Stuck in Egypt for 400 years, there's little doubt in my mind that over time, Egypt's culture and religion eroded whatever they had left of their belief in God. Adding to that, uh, Israel had no rights. They had, nor did they have any freedoms. They were slaves who were forced to work seven days a week. But then at the right time, God steps in, and he speaks to Moses in Exodus chapter 6, beginning in verse 
6. And if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn there. Exodus 6, beginning in verse 6. I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them. And I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you for possession. I am the Lord. There's a couple of things to be noted here. Notice Israel's deliverance and redemption is not based on their performance. They don't even have the law yet, so they don't even know what it means to be God's people. That means God's salvation of them and of us is purely an act of grace. When Israel hears these words, they're so demoralized, they don't believe what, what God is saying. But that would soon change as they witness the ten plagues God brings against Egypt, and then miraculously they cross the Red Sea in chapter 14. By the time we get to Exodus 19, three months have passed since Israel witnessed Pharaoh's army being swallowed up by the sea. During, and, and, and during this time, they've complained that they're dying of thirst, Another time they've complained they were starving and wished they were back in Egypt. Can you imagine that? Plus, they had to fight against the Amalekites. And, and in these three months, not only was God, uh, has God graciously made bitter water sweet, he's made water come from a rock, he's caused manna to fall from the sky six days of the week, and he saved them from a marauding army. Also, he leads them by a pillar of cloud by day and of fire by night. Now, at Mount Sinai, everything changes. At Sinai, these wandering Hebrews discover who they are and, more importantly, whose they are. So, if you have your Bibles again, flip over to Exodus 19, and we'll read from verse 3 to 6. <clears throat> Exodus 19, verse 3. While Moses went up to, the, to God, the Lord called him to him out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation." These are the words you, you shall speak to the people of Israel. When we think of Israel, or as Mount Sinai, too often we think of the, the place where Moses gets the Ten Commandments. And, and that's all we think about Sinai. We may have visions of, of uh, you know, a volcano and thunder and lightning and, and just an a, a, just a awesome presence of the Lord. But we miss the grace in this passage alone, we see four ways in how God demonstrates his grace. Number one, his decisive victory over Egypt. Secondly, his loving care for Israel in the wilderness. Not only did he provide for their daily needs, but he protected them and carried them as if they were on eagle's wings. Third, God invites them into covenant faithfulness. He's not like Pharaoh, who's like a harsh taskmaster. God invites them into a relationship. And if they say yes, he offers his commitment to bless them. Fourth, God has chosen Israel to be his ambassador. They are set apart from any other peoples. They are his treasured possession. And out of the nations, they are to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Again, I, I say this to remind you that Israel has done nothing to merit God's deliverance. And then without deserving it, God gives them a precious identity plus a purpose and role to match. This calling is not forced. These people have a choice. And in verse 8, we see their response. They say, all the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. After chapter 19, uh, we get to chapter 20, and we have the Ten Commandments, and then uh, a couple of chapters explaining the laws of how to build altars and how to treat slaves and making restitution, matters of so social justice, how to observe the Sabbath and other festivals. Uh, to be honest, let, let, you know, 
it, it's easy to skip over those parts we consider boring. We'd rather get to the juicy parts, but I think Israel was happy to get these laws. Why would I say that? Well, uh, let, let's try to uh, walk in their sandals for a moment. Um, the Israelites lived during a time when the peoples of the nations couldn't know what their deaf and dumb gods were saying unless their priests could discern possible meanings by looking at animal livers and their intestines or how the stars were aligned. But even after that, there was a lot of ambiguity and they couldn't figure out what the gods wanted. But this isn't the way with Israel. God takes the initiative. He chooses them. He saves them and makes them his people. And then he tells them what he expects. God speaks. There's no guesswork. And it's important to remember that God did not say to them, do all of these things and I will save you from slavery. He saved them first. And then he gave them the gift that goes along with salvation. And that is instructions on how to be uh, his people and free people. To better understand the Ten Commandments, we need to read them in context. When we recall the Ten Commandments, uh, can you do it by heart? Uh, we, we think of the first one begins with, Thou shalt not have any other gods before me. But that's not entirely correct. The first commandment actually begins with the saying, or the sentence, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the land of a house of slavery. And so this preceding sentence really forms the groundwork of how we should view everything else. These commands are given to them by a God who's rescued them from slavery, a God who's entered into a covenant relationship with them, who has revealed to them his personal name. So what so because of what God has graciously done, they should they should want to respond by worshiping no one else but the Lord. That's the first command. And the second is also very important for, for us to understand. It says in verse 7, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Taking God's name. I, used, I, I grew up thinking that it was, you know, uh, using his name as a swear word. And uh, that it, it involves much more than that, and here's why. Most translators have translated the Hebrew word nasa to mean take because it makes more sense. But the word nasa can mean to lift up, care, or bear. So if we replace the word nasa or, or replace the word with uh, take with bear, you shall not bear or carry the name of Yahweh your God in vain, we get a deeper meaning. The picture becomes a little clearer when we look at chapter 8 where instructions are given for what the priests are to wear. One of the fanciest parts Aaron is Aaron's apron because it's woven with golden strands or threads and set with 12 precious stones uh, uh, on his chest. And each stone is engraved with a name of one of the 12 tribes. The priest bears or carries the name of Israel before God. And Aaron also wears a name on his forehead. Yahweh, and tied to his turban is a gold medallion engraved with the words holy belonging to Yahweh. The 12 precious stones indicate that the high priest represents the entire nation before God. The medallion on his forehead says that he is the Lord's authorized representative to the nation. And so when we look back to Exodus 19 and, and the titles God gives there, titles like treasured possession, kingdom of priests, holy nation, God is calling them to represent him to the rest of the world. Just as the high priest represents God to them, they are uh, to bear or carry God's name to the nations. To bear God's name in vain is to enter into a covenant relationship with him, but to live no differently than the surrounding nations. I'm going to say that again because I think it's really important. To bear God's name in vain is to enter into a covenant relationship with him, but to live no differently than the surrounding nations. So how is camping out in Exodus 19 and bearing God's name relevant for us today? And what does this have to do with missions? 
I'm glad you asked. We're getting there. In Matthew 1, Matthew shows us in verse 16 that Jesus is called the Christ or Messiah, which means uh, anointed one. But further toward the end of the chapter, when, when uh, Joseph has a dream, an angel tells him that he is to call his, his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So Jesus is his name, and Messiah is his title. Adding to that, Matthew recalls the words from Isaiah 7 when he writes that a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel. And of course, we know that Emmanuel means God with us. Jesus is God himself come to be with his people. And yet, while Jesus is on the earth, Jesus doesn't focus on his own name. Instead, he magnifies the name of the Father. When he teaches his disciples to pray, for instance, Jesus' opening words are, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. This implies a personal commitment to honoring that name through a life of faithful obedience. For Jesus, the key characteristic of one who truly belongs to God is a, is a commitment to obedient action, to doing his will rather than, than one's own. Jesus takes take, uh, uh, his calling as God's representative, his Father's representative, so seriously that others can see God just by looking at him. In John chapter 5, verse 36, Jesus says that the testimony he has is greater than of John because he's doing the works that his father has given him to do. And these works bear testimony that he's been sent by God. And in John 12, 44, Jesus says, Whoever believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And whoever sees me sees him who sent me. This is not just because Jesus is God incarnate. It is also because Jesus' behavior and character reflect God's, the way every covenant member's character should. Jesus wants us, his disciples, to imitate him. By bearing God's name, Jesus lives out Israel's vocation. He shows us, and he shows us how it ought to be done. And just to be clear, Jesus did not live or, or insulate himself by living in a Christian bubble. In fact, just the opposite is true. During his interaction with Zacchaeus in Luke 19, Jesus said that he came to seek and to save the lost. In Matthew 20, 28, Jesus explained that he did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. So Jesus fully understood what his job on earth was, and he committed himself to bring honor to the Father's name. But it is not just up, up to Jesus to accomplish this. Jesus did finish all the work that God gave him to do, but he did not finish all the work. Just as he was sent to do the Father's will, he sends us into the world. We are commissioned to carry out this mission. We see this clearly in Acts 9 when we read of Saul's dramatic conversion experience while on the road to Damascus. Blinded, Jesus tells Saul to go into the city, and around the same time, the Lord speaks to Ananias in a vision to look for Saul. Ananias, of course, is a little perturbed at this because, you know, he's heard of Saul's reputation, but he does so and, uh, because God has chosen Paul to carry Jesus' name before the Gentiles, the kings, and the Jews. So Saul's commission to bear or carry the Lord's name as his ambassador is not unique. We are expected to bear God's name too. In 2 Corinthians 5.17, Paul says that when we become a Christian, uh, we become a new creation. Then he goes on to say in verse 20, and, and I encourage you to, to follow there, uh, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 20, all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to him and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God is making his appeal through us. When I think of the word ambassador, immediately uh, I, I, my memories go back to my interactions with the ambassador to the Czech Republic when trying to obtain visas for our family. It was a nightmare. Uh, I don't remember how many Skype calls I had with him, but uh, 
uh, as long as he said we couldn't go because we didn't meet this rep, uh, requirement or that requirement, we couldn't leave the country. No amount of arm twisting or flattering him would change his mind. He took his role and his job very serious, seriously. We are God's ambassadors. It's a high calling, and it does not come without cost. Jesus said in Matthew 16, beginning in verse 24, that if anyone comes after him, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. No doubt Peter remembered that those words when he wrote in 1 Peter 4, 12 to 14, Beloved, don't be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you're insulted for the name of Christ, you're blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But Peter warns us that we shouldn't be foolish. In verse 15, he says that none of us should be suffering because of sin. Duh. But if we suffer as a Christian, we shouldn't be ashamed, but rather glorify God because of it. I'm sure you've noticed that the world, it seems, is in a state of upheaval and confusion. All over the world, the climate is going crazy. I mean, it's the hottest year on record. Uh, wildfires, uh, scorching heat. Uh, the, the economy is also equally unstable. There are food shortages, the war in Ukraine, of course. And, and perhaps what what's disturbs me most are the ideologies that openly and brazenly oppose God. It's getting to the point where uh, we're not always comfortable standing up for the truth. And we wish God would make everything right again and that he would do it right now. He will. But we also serve a God whose primary purpose is not to make us more comfortable or successful. We serve a God who's deeply interested in transforming us to be more like his son Jesus. According to Colossians 1.15, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. He represents the Father perfectly, but he is not the first image of God. In Genesis 1.26, we see Adam and Eve were first designated as God's image bearers. However, there's a big difference between being an image bearer and bearing God's name. Every person alive or who has ever lived is an image bearer whether they know it or not. The person who cuts you off in traffic is an image bearer. The person who um, sells drugs is an image bearer. They may not know it, but they are the crown of creation. People bear witness to the majesty of God. Name bearing, on the other hand, is kept for those who are in covenant relationship with God. So does that mean what happened at Mount Sinai is for us too? Jesus is coming, ushered in a new era of redemption and a new covenant, but we must remember again, salvation, whether it be Israel or ours, is by God's grace. Furthermore, the mission remains the same. While Israel's task was to bear God's name among the nation, we, the church, are to bear Jesus' name among the nations too. What is different between the covenants was the old covenant was life, a lifeless written code and up to human willpower to carry it out. And we all know how that turned out. Israel reverted back to a life of slavery because they fell into sin. But now the new covenant, confirmed by the shedding of Jesus' blood on the cross, becomes operative by the indwelling spirit who powerfully works in us and through us. Peter, writing to Gentile believers scattered throughout Asia Minor, writes in 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim with the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you were God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you've received mercy. Peter's words sound very familiar, don't they? 
But Peter doesn't just place these titles on us with, without thinking about the implications of what they mean for us. In verse 12, he writes, Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Back in Exodus, Israel was chosen to bear or carry God's name among the nations. Through the work of Christ, we, by God's grace, have become name bearers too. David Platt has said, Disciple making is not a call for others to come to us to hear the gospel but a command for us to go to others to share the gospel. I believe this to be true. And yet, uh, every time we're in Manitoba, I am struck by just how many ethnicities are represented in society. German, Polish, Ukrainian, uh, Filipino, French, English, Spanish, Middle Eastern. It seems the world is coming to us. Yet it's up to us to tell others of Jesus. Each person is made in God's image, but do they bear his name? Whether God has called you to serve as a missionary somewhere overseas or not, he's called you to bear his name to those who don't yet. In Paul's letter to the Galatians, he describes himself as bearing the marks of Jesus on his body. And the Greek word for marks is stigmata, and the word was used outside of the Bible to refer to the brands of slaves as well as religious tattoos. Now, I'm not proposing, just in case you're, you're getting a little nervous here, I'm not proposing that we all get tatted up. But in 2 Corinthians 1, 21 and 22, Paul declares that it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us and who has also put his seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. In other words, being filled with God's spirit is the evidence that believers belong to him. Uh, it's like we bear the, a spiritual tattoo of his name. This spiritual tattoo actually becomes visible to John as he records what he sees in Revelation 7. There he sees an angel has been commissioned to mark the foreheads of those who belong to God to protect them from judgment. Those who cho choose not to become a part of the redeemed community have a tattoo also, but it bears a different name. And in chapter, Revelation chapters 13 through 17, John, John sees in a vision a beast that speaks blasphemous things and it bears blasphemous things on his head. And he, and he sees a second beast Mark the hands and the foreheads of those who reject Jesus. And they go along to persecute all those who refuse to receive that mark. No one is neutral. People either bear God's name or the name of the beast. Each mark indicates the object of their worship and their, where their allegiance lies. Because of the faithfulness of Jesus, we can be marked with God's name and participate in his mission to be a blessing to all nations. As members of Jesus' new covenant community, we have the privilege of living as his treasured people. Through Christ, we have an identity, and he calls us to fulfill the role of bearing his name to others. Our faith is proved genuine by our obedience. It is expressed in love for the God who graciously rescued us from sin and death and through our love for others. Loving God with our everything and loving our neighbor as ourselves sums up the law and the fact that God has revealed to us what pleases him is an invitation to follow him, to become like him, and to join him on mission. Before going to heaven, Jesus gave what has been called the Great Commission in Matthew 28, which is to make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything he taught. What are these new believers sent to do? Make more disciples. Faithful obedience is key to the success of the mission. Once baptized, these new followers will also bear his name. As Jesus' representatives, they are promised that he will be with them while they live out their calling. Do you remember Peter from Mukambo? A month or two after we got back from Brazil, I saw Peter was on Instagram. So I reached out to him and we started a conversation. This was part of that first conversation. This is what Peter writes. Since you left, I started a Bible study. I quit college to realize what God really wanted for me. 
I don't want to be just one more person in the world who's looking for the best job or trying to make the most money no matter what. I don't think this is for me. I remember when you asked me how I would describe myself, so I'm trying to figure that out. But now with God, I want to be one of his disciples. I want to share the gospel. I just don't know how yet. In case you're wondering, Peter did accept Christ with one of the help of our missionaries, and he and I have continued to be in contact. And uh, Peter has had some ups and downs, but he's committed to bearing his name. In fact, at the time of this recording, at the end of July, he is right now helping out with a vacation Bible school in Macombo. I just read this morning, there's 70 kids already uh, attending, and he's helping. While we were in Mukambo, we also met Marcelo. Marcelo is 15, and we, when we met him, he was a new Christian. He got baptized, and a week after his baptism, his family kicked him out of the house. I, I've been keeping up with Marcelo, too, and in early May, Marcelo asked me how I became a missionary because he wants to be one. So I shared my story, and I shared with some scriptures to encourage him to be faithful to God, no matter how small a task, because if we're not faithful in the small things, how can we be trusted with the big things? I went on to tell him that he doesn't have to leave Mukambo in order to be a missionary, and this was his reply. Oh, okay, I, I learn now to trust God in God's timing and to be faithful in the small things. Yes, I'm going to be a little missionary in my school and in my family. Like Peter, Marcelo has his ups and downs too. But he's trying to live out of his faith in his community. In fact, at the end of June, he and I chatted and I asked how I could be praying for him. And this is what he wrote. I think what brings me more stress is when I am alone. My thoughts are a million. Then I think straight about what I'm going to do. So I go and pray and trust myself more in the Lord Jesus Christ. And what makes me happy is to stay close to my brothers in the faith. You can pray for me because I will present 1 Thessalonians 3.12 tomorrow night. And I've been practicing. But this is my first time preaching the gospel of our Lord Jesus. I caught up with Marcelo last week. And he sent me a picture of the 1040 window, and he asked me if I knew what this represented. And I said, yes, uh, it's the 1040 window, the area of the least amount of Christians in the world. And Marcelo shared his burden for the people of Libya. He feels called to Libya. He's 15, so right now he's researching everything Libya. At 15, Marcelo has been rejected because he bears God's name, and he's proud to do so. As 1 Peter 4.14 says, Marcelo is blessed. Just as I asked Peter from Mukambo who he was, I'm asking you, who are you? If you know who you are, my prayer for you, for all of us, is that we would also remember that attached to our identity as a follower of Jesus is the calling to bear God's name to those around us. Perhaps you're wondering just how you could do that how you could bear God's name. Let me suggest something simple. You begin by praying, asking God, who specifically can you be reaching out to? I'm willing to bet, as I speak right now, names are popping into your head, right? I certainly hope so. People, it could be people from your workplace, your classmates, teammates, friends, family members, whoever they are, commit to praying for them. And then pray also for yourself, for courage, that as God provides an opportunity, you would bear or represent God's name well. In closing, I want to reread 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. But you, Bothwell Christian Fellowship, are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, 
But now you have received mercy. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for who you are. You are a saving God, a God who delivers us from slavery. We didn't deserve salvation. We still don't. And yet you continue to save us. We thank you that along with salvation, you, you look at us and we are treasured. We're valuable to you. And not only that, you have given us an identity as sons and daughters of the Most High God, uh, 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 belonging to a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Thank you for adopting us into your family. We do, you have not given us what we do deserve. What we do deserve is your wrath. And I pray, O oh Father, that we would bear your name, that we would remember who we are, and that with joy and love, we would carry out our calling in the power of the Holy Spirit. There are thousands of people around us who bear your image. But those thousands of people, not everyone bears your name. And so, Father, give us a heart for the lost. And give us the, the, the power to bear your name to them. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for allowing me the privilege of uh, speaking to you today. I'll just hand it over to whoever's in charge this morning. God bless you. What a challenge. We bear his image. Do we bear his name? I invite you to stand, and we're going to close with the benediction song. upon you. May the Lord lift you, turn his face towards you, give you his peace, give you his peace. May the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord smile on us, shine his light upon us. May the Lord lift us, turn his face towards us. Give us his peace, give us his peace. Blessed we came to this place today and blessed now we will go in the name of the Father the Spirit and the Son blessed we came to this place today and blessed now we will go in the name of the Father the Spirit and the Son. May the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord smile on us, shine His light upon us. May the Lord lift us his face towards us. Give us his peace. Give us his peace. 
Go now in peace. Go now.